can just wait for a minute here to make sure the YouTube is set up properly. And then uh, we'll get started. I have some announcements to make for projects, so uh, we'll just hang on for that. In the recording. Okay, that seems to be working. All right, um, so welcome back everyone. Uh, we are going to start by just talking a little bit about um, the, the projects. So uh, as you know, if you go to our um, a reading group uh, lecture page, which some of you I think are on, um, Basically, this week, we have to have a listing of your project titles, okay? So again, the project title doesn't, um, it's just a notional project, so you just need to put down one liner. Um, and uh, the understanding is if you're working with a partner you're, or, or partners up to four people, that you put the same uh, project name uh, in your title. So for example, uh, Chai Yufan and uh, Victor are doing, um, uh, sorry, and Fiona are doing document level relation uh, extraction. Uh, I think Fiona's on the call, is that correct? Yes, yes, Great. Um, so yeah, I saw you're on chat too, okay, great. Um, and then we have a couple people, Alexandra and his uh, friend Romain, they're both doing uh, understanding transformers. Um, uh, Sunil also put this on the projects page. If some of you would like to do a, a neural search engine, he's interested in doing uh, that uh, based on Chris Manning's book. Um, Abdul is interested in domain adaptation. Um, there are three of our first year students doing uh, medical dialogue generation using BERT. Um, two people, I guess, uh, interested in uh, something very close to Prof Ang's uh, uh, area, which is grammatical error correction. And then um, another student, Alex Fu, uh, who works with me also in the, the CS3244 course is a self-supervised learning using transformers. Then we have uh, Yi Ching and uh, Zi Rui and uh, Jia Qi all working on human robot interaction through language. So that looks like an interesting problem. Uh, maybe you You'll be using policy gradients or other things like that to help with that. And then Ya Jing uh, from my own group is going to be looking at named entity recognition uh, through uh, the lens of uh, the data science uh, toolkit for uh, scholarly process document processing in my group called SciWing. So um, yeah, those of you who are still highlighted in red, uh, so Kush, uh, uh, Sha Chong, um, Malik, uh, and uh, a number of our first year PhD students, as well as Judith uh, Zipeng, um, and all of those other of you who haven't put in something yet, uh, do talk with um, other people on the projects channel, maybe even during our presentation today, and see whether there's something of interest to you. Okay, so you do need to put in something uh, this week as a notional thing. Again, the project should be about uh, 40 to 60 hours of work in total on your side. Uh, so if you have multiple people, hopefully you can work together to, to bring something up to uh, a more manageable um, size, right? Um, and the deliverable is very simple. Um, you need to create a poster at the end of the semester in week 13 um, to display at our um, uh, SOC project term showcase um, that's held at night on Wednesday. So it's a Wednesday night from 6 to 10 p.m. So um, if you can make it, that's great. If you can't, then hopefully you're in a team where somebody else in a team can present. But it's also, a, again, a, a time to socialize and talk with other people about their projects as well. Okay, so with that, I think uh, we can get started. Let's uh, turn it over to the main crew for today. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Okay, and then uh, if you guys have any questions, uh, feel free to ask me either in chat or in Slack. Again, um, chat is very convenient because it's part of a uh, Zoom, but then it's harder for people to remember to take notes from that. So I would um, recommend that you use uh, where possible the Slack channel because um, all of us uh, hopefully are using a Slack client where you can keep updated with the messages on general. 
and on projects, okay? So without further ado, uh, let's have uh, our presenters for this week um, start uh, their presentation for week five. All right, uh, I think uh, it's me going first. Uh, okay, uh, then let's get started. Uh, so uh, in this week, uh, our group is going to present four papers. Uh, which is shown here. And I will be presenting the first paper uh, that is learning neural templates for text generation. Uh, I think it's a non, uh, this is a non-sequence to sequence method for controllable text generation. Uh, but I think this idea is quite good. Um, okay, uh, then let's get started. Uh, so uh, this is a, a paper in uh, MLP 2018. Uh, it's a work by the Harvard NLP, by the Harvard NLP group. Oh, there are some echoes. <laughs> okay, okay, sure. <clears throat> okay, so first uh, I'll introduce uh, what is the task of this paper. So this paper is uh, focusing on the data to text generation. Uh, so what is data to text generation? As you can see uh, from these two examples. Uh, uh, so basically uh, that is the input is a, a set of uh, like a structured uh, representations. Uh, for example, a knowledge triples or uh, some kind of uh, structured representations uh, like this. Uh, so uh, based on these uh, structured representations, you need to generate a description that best describes uh, this uh, uh, structure knowledge. For example, uh, here is a data set called the E2E NLG challenge. So here uh, the input is a source entity. Uh, uh, here is a kotal, and uh, then the, it has uh, several attributes for uh, for these entities. But for example, it is a coffee shop, and its rating is three out of five, and it delivers uh, English food, uh, and it's uh, located near the Poland Arms. And the system uh, and the system generate a, uh, a sentence that uh, included all of those information, uh, uh, which is shown here. <laughs> and uh, in the right part is similar. Uh, this is called uh, this is a, a wiki bio data set. So this data set is actually collected from the Wikipedia. Uh, if you are familiar with Wikipedia, uh, there uh, there is usually a info box. Uh, so uh, together with the article, uh, which shows some uh, main attributes for, for the entity. For example, here, uh, this person, uh, it has his uh, date of birth, date of death, uh, nationality, uh, and also some uh, well-known works. So uh, the task is to, based on this all this information, to generate a description or, uh, or a bio for this person. Okay, I think you all understand what is a task, uh, and then I will go on. So to address this problem, a uh, uh, key challenge is that uh, how can we ensure that all the information in the structured knowledge are included in the description? Uh, so a uh, very uh, I think a very intuitive method is to use the template-based generation, uh, which follows these three steps. So first, you need to encode the source, the source data. Uh, and then the second, uh, you select a template. For example, here, uh, here is a, a very typical template to describe uh, like a, a shop. Uh, and uh, uh, here are some uh, many blanks in the template. So then the uh, last, uh, last step is to fill in the blank. Uh, uh, so based on this uh, uh, input knowledge, uh, this looks uh, easy, but uh, there are two problems we need to address. So uh, first is that uh, how can we know uh, uh, what template should we choose? Uh, so in this paper, it actually uh, 
uh, propose to learn the templates uh, from from the data from the training data. Uh, and uh, and the second problem is that uh, because uh, the template uh, is very uh, like a fix, uh, the template is fixed. So uh, this will uh, sacrifice the language variety, uh, uh, the, which means that, uh, I, 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 but yeah, because the template is fixed. Uh, so uh, in, in this case, the generated sentence are li likely uh, uh, not very diverse. So uh, we need some sort of paraphrasing. Uh, so, uh, so in order to do that, uh, actually this paper introduced a very interesting idea called neural templates to address this problem. All right. Uh, so what is a neural template means? So basically a neural template is a sequence of neural states uh, and uh, which is shown here. And uh, uh, each, each state uh, is essentially a hidden vector. Uh, and, and, and this hidden vector will, uh, uh, will send to an RNN as the initialization to, uh, like to, uh, to generate its specific contents. Uh, so, uh, and, each, uh, neural, uh, and each neural state uh, will, uh, most, uh, so in most cases, it only corresponds to one phrase uh, or uh, like a, a short phrase. For example, here, uh, this, uh, 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 this neural, st neural state vector, uh, we are likely to generate uh, uh, these sentences, uh, these phrases such as is a, is an, and is an expensive. And uh, for example, here, uh, this uh, neural, t uh, neural state, we are, uh, we are likely to generate uh, verbs like uh, providing, serving, and offering. Uh, so in this case, the uh, the template is actually a sequence of neural states instead of uh, a fixed uh, language template. In, uh, so, so, so basically in this case, uh, it actually addressed the paraphrasing problem uh, because uh, um, we can generate different uh, languages based on different contents we, uh, we fill in the blank. <laughs> uh, so how, how, how the model, uh, how, the, how this paper models this process, uh, it actually use the uh, hidden semi-Markov model. So I, I first introduced this. So I think most of you are quite familiar with the HMM, that is a hidden Markov model. Uh, uh, so basically in hidden Markov model, uh, there are a sequence of uh, unob unobserved latent variables, Cs, uh, and for each, uh, 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 for each unobserved latent variable, it will correspond to one observation y. Uh, but the only difference between HMM and, uh, and the semi-Markov model is that uh, here in the semi-Markov model, uh, one hidden variable uh, will correspond to multiple uh, observations. For example, here, this C1 actually can decode three uh, observations y1, y2, and y3. And this uh, c4 only produces one token, y4. Uh, this is the only difference. Uh, and uh, uh, this, uh, this paper uh, further make it in a neural way to address the data to text generation. Uh, so essentially in the, uh, uh, in this uh, semi-Markov uh, semi model, it, it, it essentially has two parts to model. The first is the transition between states. That is the T here. Uh, so uh, this transition distribution is actually modeled by a feedforward neural network, uh, which takes uh, one hidden state as input and to produce another hidden state. Uh, and um, another, another part is the emission distribution. That is given the uh, one hidden state, uh, how can we produce uh, its contents, uh, y1, y2, and y3. Uh, so because the number of tokens we uh, we decode may uh, may be different. So uh, here, this emission distribution is modeled by a sequence-to-sequence -sequence model with uh, the coping mechanism. Uh, so you can see that uh, the uh, here the encoder first encodes the input data that is x, uh, and then uh, it sends this to a decoder. 
and the decoder also takes uh, takes the uh, hidden state z as input. So these two x and z will guide the decoder to decode uh, the corresponding contents. Uh, so uh, now the problem is how can we learn uh, the model parameters? That is how can we learn this transition function and this emission function based on our training data. Uh, so uh, to summarize the training data is a set of X and Y, uh, S, Y pairs. That is a set of data and the ground truth uh, sentence uh, pairs. And the unknown parameters are the hidden state Z, transition network T, and the decoder network L. Uh, this is what we want to learn. Uh, and the uh, learning objective is, uh, is of course to maximize the log likelihood uh, of the observed, uh, uh, observed samples x, y. Uh, so uh, which is shown in this equation, this is the training objective. And here you uh, note that because we have latent variables in this generation process C. So, uh, so in the optimization, we need to uh, marginalize over all possible Cs. So actually uh, in practice, this is uh, in, uh, intractable. Uh, but actually this is a well-studied problem uh, in, uh, uh, in HMM. Um, so, so in HMM, we uh, can use a dynamic programming method called a forward backward algorithm uh, to address this optimization problem. So it is similar to apply this algorithm here in this uh, uh, semi-Markov model. All right, so uh, after we learned the model parameters, that, that, we, that is we learned the trans transition uh, network and the emission network, uh, we can then uh, uh, do the inference based on this. The inference means that uh, now when we are given an observation X and Y, uh, that is the data input and the ground truth uh, utterance, we want to infer uh, the hidden states. That is, uh, that is uh, uh, the most probable uh, hidden state Z. Uh, also, in other words, the most probable neural template uh, uh, at raise this y. So to find this z, uh, there is also a well-studied algorithm uh, based on dynamic programming called the uh, Witter B algorithm. Uh, it is a very common, uh, it's a very famous algorithm uh, used in uh, HMM. It can be also brought here to address uh, this problem. Okay, so now uh, given each data sample, we can uh, inf uh, uh, we can do the inference to get its most probable uh, neural templates. So we can then go through each example in the training data. Uh, in this case, we can extract the most common neural templates from the training data. Uh, so, okay, so I'll show one example here. Here is one uh, common neural template extracted from the E2E dataset. So note that uh, here, there are some bracket is here, actually, uh, and, and there are some uh, numbers here. So actually this means, uh, these numbers me actually means uh, like uh, uh, the, uh, the index of the uh, hidden, ve uh, hidden vector. For example, uh, uh, here actually means Z185. Uh, but in order to uh, better visualize this template, uh, it actually shows the most probable decoding of this Z. Uh, for example, here, this, uh, these hidden states uh, most probably will decode a phrase like, uh, like the uh, Westlers. Uh, and here, uh, when we uh, like, uh, ext uh, and, and, and here is the uh, one common neural template, uh, that is the sequence of Z's uh, extracted from the E2E dataset. Uh, and then finally, uh, so then finally in, in the uh, testing time, now we can do the controllable question generation, uh, sorry, the, uh, the controllable text generation. That is, uh, we, uh, we have the most common templates in hand and then we can actually uh, pick, uh, pick up one your templates and then re uh, restrict the model to uh, 
uh, produced a, a sequence uh, based on this neural template. Uh, and, uh, and with different uh, neural templates that we choose, we can uh, uh, like control the model uh, to, uh, to generate certain information or to not generate uh, certain information. For example, here uh, it shows uh, one example uh, to generate a description about this entity, uh, Kenny Warren. Uh, and uh, the input is uh, a set of uh, uh, attributes uh, for, for this entity. Uh, such as a name, the birth date, first name. And uh, here uh, they have, uh, it choose five different neural templates. Uh, and, uh, of, uh, and each of these uh, neural templates will generate different uh, contents. Uh, okay, so I think, uh, and finally they show some empirical results uh, uh, on, the, on these two data set, the E2E and the Wikibio. Uh, and you can see here actually uh, the performance uh, actually cannot outperform the, the basic sequence to sequence model. Uh, but uh, I think this is understandable because uh, when you uh, introduce more controls into your models, uh, it, is, uh, it is very likely that you will sacrifice some performance. So although that this model is uh, uh, does not perform uh, uh, does not outperform the sequence sequence. Uh, it actually brings more controls uh, into uh, what what you are going to generate. Uh, so I think that's the highlight of this paper. Uh, and uh, and uh, and also I think the method of uh, using the neural uh, semi Markov model uh, is quite a, I think quite elegant quite elegant method. <laughs> ah yeah, and so that's all. Ah thank you. Uh, so you can you may ask uh, some questions. Yeah, so it'd be good. So Samson has a question. He has his hand up. You want to start? I, yeah. So how does the how how does the model decide how to segment the sentence? Because I notice that each bracket can have a variable number of words, right? Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, yes. As like uh, shown here. Yes. Yeah. So how does it how does it decide? How many, how many words belong to one of the states? Uh, I, I think it is the just uh, learn from the data. Yeah. Mm, because, yeah, because uh, actually this emission network is actually modeled by an RNN. So uh, uh, the RNN will decide uh, so when to stop. Uh, uh, so given this uh, hidden state that it improves. So is it? So then, is it like a hierarchical RNN? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's uh, similar. Uh, it's, yeah, it's like uh, yeah, you, you, yeah, you can think of it as a hierarchical method. Uh, yeah, because each uh, each hidden state actually con only controls a part of the uh, of the generation. Uh, uh, but I think this is a uh, uh, but I think this is uh, actually belongs to the uh, I think it's a hidden variables generation uh, uh, type of uh, method. So uh, it is uh, things not uh, essentially the same with the hierarchical RNN, yeah. Then, so then how does it know, like, like how does it know, uh, so like how does it encode this start and stop thing? Is it like, a, like some kind of index or like how does it, like how does it represent the segment as a as a latent state? Uh, sorry. Uh, so like, I, like kind of quite got it. So like, so if you if you go to one of the examples. Uh yeah. Yeah. So like here, right? How so? How does it know that? No. So how does it represent? Uh, Let's say this uh, the restless. Is it like so? It's a, it's like a vocabulary of of tokens. Is it is that right? Oh. Uh yeah, I think so. So I think. Uh, like, I mean, how like, how, is, how is it actually implemented? Actually implemented? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think this is not uh, uh 
not, not yet. I think this is another very typical type of model. So uh, maybe uh, a little bit hard to understand. Uh, but uh, actually, uh, when you have uh, like a, a defined, a, a, like this, this is essentially a graphical model like this, uh, actually you can then uh, do some uh, typical operations such as uh, learning and the inference. Uh, based on your training data. So, uh, and each part, uh, actually you have some uh, uh, well-defined algorithms for doing that. Uh, it is not based on the, uh, the normal gradient-based uh, 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 optimization, but, but it's addressed by uh, some specific algorithm. For example, here the learning is actually uh, addressed by this uh, forward-backward algorithm uh, uh, to, to, to maximize this uh, training objective. Uh, and uh, also in the inference, it actually used the uh, weighted V algorithm to, to do the inference. So uh, mm, I think this is quite different with the normal sequence to sequence method. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, so I, I, what I mean is like, so is it still like, a, so it, does it still use like a vocabulary and uh, distribution over the tokens? Like the yeah, like a distribution over the vocabulary. Ah uh, yes, I think so. Yeah, you can see here the uh, this is the optimization objective. As you can see, the uh, it will have a modeling of this uh, conditional probability. Uh, that, that that is given a, given an x uh, 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 to generate a z, and uh, then a z will generate a token of y. Uh, and uh, things uh, uh, this this y will uh, corresponds to a distribution over the vocabulary. But then, so that means when it's learning, so how does it learn the hidden state? Like, like which, so like, so is it, so is it a supervised? Is it? Uh, a yeah, yeah, it is, it is a supervised method. It's, uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know how you explain this, but uh, um, I, I think the hidden, uh, uh, the hidden variables are actually not learned, but uh, 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 it is, uh, the net the, the learnable parts are, are essentially the these two uh, networks that is how that is the model learns how to transist the one one hidden variable to another hidden variable uh, and uh, and also how to decode uh, a certain uh, hidden hidden vector um, uh, uh, so actually in the learning phrase uh, what we are learning is this decoder and this t uh, but uh, and but in the inference, uh, what we are doing is that we given an observed x and an observed uh, y sequence. We then inf uh, we, we can do a back inference. That is, we uh, uh, can in uh, we can infer uh, what is the most probable uh, sequence of these that will lead to such kind of uh, such a observation y. Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, you mean in the the training, right? Not in the testing. You're still trying to learn the, the two networks weight, right? And then yeah. when you apply the testing time, you can decide which which set of templates you want to choose, right? And then force the, the algorithm to decode using the template that you want. That's the controllable aspect, correct? Uh, uh, yeah, yes, correct. So uh, uh, yeah, like the, uh, yeah, like the inference is actually like given X and Y to infer what is the most appropriate Z uh, that we are generate this y, uh, and then uh, because we have many uh, x uh, x and y pairs in the training data, so then we can uh, like do the inference for each of this training sample, and then we are we are have uh, a lot of uh, uh, hid, uh, hidden work, uh, hidden variable sequences, uh, and then we can uh, extract the most common uh, sequence of uh, these uh, as the common neural templates. Uh, and then at testing time, uh, we pick up one common template from, from this set and then guide the model to generate uh, the, the, the sequence. Yeah, I think this is the whole process. Right. I mean, if you look at the, the paper um, in section seven, the last table, table three, uh, you guys can see what what Liang Ming is pointing at about varying the template, right? And I think he had an example on slide 11 of that, right? Uh, where yeah, yeah, yeah. you can pick out from uh, different templates 
um, different realizations, right? So those five sentences there below are due to different sequence of templates being used, right? So the, the, the common uh, sequences of Zs um, that uh, the algorithm picks up and then uh, the, the offers are applying the five, five common ones to, uh, to decode a, a sentence. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, so I have another question for why did they yeah. choose the semi Markov? Like, why did they relax the assumption of a hidden Markov model? There you assume that uh, one hidden variable will kind of like uh, emit one observed state, right? So here it is multiple. That's the that's the relaxation that the semi Markov model makes. But but why did they do that? Uh, you mean why they did uh why they why they do not directly use the like HMM so so that each mm. uh each C will correspond to only one one Y right? Yeah. Uh yeah, I think this uh for uh I think they do they are doing this for more intuitions maybe for for because uh actually it, it wants to propose an idea that uh each uh each C actually correspond to one semantic segment uh. Uh, for for example, uh, for example, this C actually correspond to uh, like uh, is a is n. Actually, this means belong to right. Uh, this is a a a, 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 a unified uh, semantic uh, uh, semantic component. Uh, and also uh, similar case for this for for this for this one. Uh, so actually, they want to say that uh, each each state in the neural templates correspond to one semantic part. Uh, in a sentence, uh, so uh, okay. so if you yeah so so if you are doing just a one to one correspondence, then uh, uh, firstly it's very hard to learn because now you have a uh, longer sequence of uh, this, and also uh, it will lack such kind of uh, uh, explanations. I, I think that's the reason. Yeah. So and whatever this image can be a combination of the words and the template, right? The dashes are the templates. Uh, uh no, the dash. Uh, no, uh, sorry, I didn't explain this. The dash are not uh, templates. Uh, the dash means that uh, the the copying word. That means that uh here, uh dash means copy. to copy one word from the source. Yeah. Ah okay, okay. Yeah. So Thanks. in the Slack, I, I posted why they're using a semi Markov model, right? So if you look at that, there's a, a excerpt of the paper that explains why, right? So you use a, a hidden Markov model, you can decode a state, but the state decoding is limited to one token. So if you want to get Z13 to realize is A or is N or is an expensive, right? Then the decoder must be semi-Markov. You, you can't just get have uh, one output. You do have to treat the whole phrase as a single output um, uh, in order to get it through an HMM. But if you use a, a semi-Markov uh, model, then you can have multiple um, emissions from a, a single output state. Okay, so that's that's the reasoning behind that. So, I mean, a Markov model, hopefully you all know, a Markov model just means that uh, you're depending only on the last time step for for decoding the current time step. But in the semi-Markov model, it, it's allowing you to go farther back, right? You, you're not encoding everything in the last state. Um, you have some dependency on time, sequence of times uh, since you started the emission. So we already know in natural language processing, longer phrases are rarer. So um, that type of intuition can be built into a HSMM. It's kind of a recurrent HMM, I guess. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. I mean, the recurrent model is based on a, a Markov model assumption too, right? Uh, and so, uh, you know, you have a, a higher chance of hitting a stop probability of ending a sentence after going through enough states. So um, the HMN and RNN are, are very uh, closely related, right? Uh, the HSMM is uh, basically giving more credence to uh, having um, emissions that or, or other uh, states which have um, longer states, uh, longer emission probabilities, meaning over multiple tokens, right? So if you're reading an input that's actually a multi-word segment or outputting a noun phrase that's a multi-word uh, segment, and you want to obey that um, uh, that type of emission probability, then you might use a, a semi-Markov state, right? 
So that's how you get all of these uh, longer than one length outputs. I think Samson, you were asking about it. How does it know to segment after three words or, or one word, right? So the, the core part of the model is that actually each transition in the neural template is for a specific emission state. And that emission state can emit an entire phrase or a single word, right? And as uh, Liang Ming pointed out on, on that slide is that even within an emission state, it can choose to generate a word or generate a copy of a word from the source, right? So those underlines that Avanov asked about, those are basically like the copy variables that we saw in CopyNet from the previous time. Yeah, yeah. Okay, other questions? You guys are, are, again, very encouraged to ask questions. You get more out of this session if you're not just passively listening, right? You get more out of it if you question and you ask. And again, it's good to follow the paper itself. Uh, if you have another window on your screen or another device, you might pick off the, the papers that uh, the group has posted on the Slack channel earlier in the week. Uh, I have a question. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's a, a more basic question. So after mm -hmm. you generate a template from, after you generate a template from uh, uh, the neural template, right? You need to fill in the blank. So actually, how, how do you ensure that like all the keywords or the entities are filling in the blanks like perfectly? Is it verified by person? Uh... Sorry, you mean how to evaluate the the uh, uh, the yeah? Because after generated. you generate the blank, you need to fill in the blanks with the entities, right? The source entities. Uh, fill in the blank. Uh, uh, no, no. I think uh, uh you, oh. you may you may hear. So, so uh, this one is completely discarded. Is it oh, this procedure? Uh, no, no. I think I think this is only to show. The basic idea of this paper, uh, actually, the the it, this this paper actually does not follow these three steps. Actually, uh, it is the uh, the, you, you do not have to first generate a blank and then fill in a blank. It is just uh, uh, directly decode all the uh, 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 tokens in a se sequence. Uh, oh, okay. Not uh, uh, yeah. Uh, not 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 first generate uh, a blank uh, and then fill in. Uh, can you explain again on page thirteen? How do you Come up with, uh, how do you generate the uh like the 185 and 24, uh, 29 like next to the tokens? After which one? The one like after the restless the 185. 185. On the top part. On the top up, up here. On the top. Oh, oh here, here. Okay, I see. Uh, you mean you mean how 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 do we get such a, a neural template or uh, uh, how 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 do we use this template to gen for generation? Uh, like how like how how do you obtain that? Uh, yeah. Uh, I think uh, I explained in this slide, right? So um, it, it actually has three steps. So so first uh, we uh uh for uh so so for each training data x y in our in our training set uh, we first do an inference to infer uh, the neural templates uh, for this for this data sample uh, and then we do that for each of the training sample uh, in our training set then we will have uh, a lot of uh, uh, neural templates and these neural templates may uh, I think uh, I think some of them may, may, may be exactly the same, right? So we, we can then uh, select those most common neural sequences uh, as our template. Uh, and then after we, that is how we get uh, this, uh, this template. This is oh. a common uh, neural template extracted from this data set. So, so, so the one if I means like how many occurrences are there like how many uh, occurrences that are among the templates, is it? How many no, that's just an index. So uh, this part means that there is a neural template that is numbered 185 that was um, um, uh, inferred from the model of training, right? Oh. Um, yeah, and this yeah, might yeah, actually this, uh... not be um, the actual words. It could be that it copied 
a uh, named entity from the source, right? Oh. But other ones like here is a that was from a neural state 29. So there's a, a, a neural template 29 that might actually cost um, generate these specific words is a uh, from it. Oh, okay, thank you. So if you look yeah, at yeah. the first figure um, that Yang Ming presented from the tape paper, yes, yes. which is on your figure one, yeah, this one shows you what's inside, right? So if you look at figure one, even from the, the paper itself, you'll see the neural template also. I'll put it into Slack since some of you may not have the paper in front of you. Oh, okay. I got it. So uh, you're fitting the model with the uh, with, with the sequence of uh, clues uh, one at a time uh, um, during uh, during inference time. Is that correct? Mm, uh, during inference time. Yeah. Mm, so you uh, mean during. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what do you mean? You mean you, yeah, you this? Turning the. Um, the, the slide next slide maybe it's more illustrative turning the um the tabular data into a bunch of possible neural templates uh in practice uh to do that in practice you need to uh in to to give um the data piece by piece to the to the network is that right like first i mean to the model you first give it kenny warren and uh, and then you give it at birth date and so on. Um, yes, is is it uh, work? because uh, yeah, yeah yeah because my question then is uh, is the uh, output going to differ if you uh, change the order of the tabular data? So for instance, I start with the notable work, then I give the name, you know, then I give the birth name and so on, in in a different order that would confuse uh, the model or is, is expecting the uh, input to follow a particular sequence? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think this is a good question. Yeah, I think uh, actually, uh, uh, actually this, all, all, all these parts right here is actually corresponds to the input data uh, that is at the X, uh, right? Uh, and uh, so you, as you can see in this, uh, in this diagram, uh, the X is uh, always conditioned. That is, uh, when you when you generate uh, based on one state uh, in a neural template, uh, you will be conditioning on the on this X. That is, you will be conditioning on all of these uh, uh, attributes. Uh, so, but uh, but but these attributes are actually encoded by uh, an encoder, uh, which will turn all of this information into just a, a, a single vector. Uh, okay. so, uh, so, uh, so as you said, uh, if we change the orders uh, of these attributes, uh, so uh, in this case, we, we may, we may uh, result in a different uh, uh, vector uh, for, for, for this X. So yeah, it is likely to uh, result in different uh, model generations. Uh, I, 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 yeah, but, but I think the, in this paper, the author does not, uh, uh, did not uh, investigate this uh, problem. Yeah. So the number of states is predetermined. Is it is it like a vocabulary of states? Uh, the you mean the number of these? Yeah. Uh, yes, that uh, actually these, these are actually have a large vocabulary, like uh, uh, they are indexed, uh, for example, one, two, three, uh, all the way, for example, to 100. Uh, so, and then, uh, so each one will correspond to one vector. And uh, uh, so it's like a then, giant matrix that's been yeah. predetermined, like the size has been predetermined. Yeah, the size. Uh, yeah, the, the size is pretty determined, and this uh, and the vector for each uh, hidden uh, hidden vector is uh, uh, is learned uh, during the training. So it's like the it's actually like the word embedding. You can you can view C C one as a special kind of word embeddings, uh, and uh, and you, it will, will will be learned during the training. Yeah. Right. 
So, but then how? So how? How does it? I I still don't really understand how. Like, let's say for a given sentence, how does it know which are the Z's that should be corresponding to those segments that are in the sentences? Ah, uh, you mean how to do the inference, right? Ah, uh, maybe. <laughs> Ah uh, yeah yeah that is uh, okay okay I will explain this more so like uh, the inference actually means that uh now you have an x and also you have a uh, already know all of these y's uh, and then you want you to uh do a uh, do a back inference to to know what these are right so because we have a uh, uh, like a set of uh, z's for example we have a uh, uh, one hundred uh, possible z's so. Uh, actually, this means that uh, a, a very brute force algorithm is that we uh, uh, we uh, iterate over all possible z's, right? For example, this z could be z1, and this could be z2, and then uh, this could be z1, and this could be z3, and this could be z1, this could be z4. Uh, and yeah, in this case, we have 100 times 100 possibilities, right? So, uh, um, and each uh, each uh, each each possible assignment will gives us a, a likelihood that uh, when when we are given these uh, this uh, how likely it will lead to this observation, uh, and then we will choose from all these uh, ten thousand uh, possibilities to find the one that has the maximum likelihood. That is how the inference is actually done. But uh, uh, but uh, but of course this is the uh, very inefficient. So uh, uh, what they use are actually a dynamic programming method called the uh, uh, Witterby algorithm. <laughs> oh, okay, so then, it, but then, it, so wait, so the, so are the vectors changed during this process or is it? Is it... No, no, the vectors does not change because, uh, be, uh, because uh, uh, you should know that learning and the inference are two different uh, stage. You you first do the learning. The learning actually will get the uh, all, 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 uh, get the vector for each uh, for each possible z. That is the vector for z one, vector for z two. It is a, it is learned during the training, and then during the inference, uh, all of those vectors are actually fixed. It. Uh, you uh, the, in the inference, your job is to uh, identify the ordering uh, of these z's, uh, but but not the but, but, but not to learn the vector of Z. Wait, okay, so then during training, during training, right? Like, yeah. so it, it has a bunch of, like let's say for each sentence, how do you determine, so how does it learn the Z's during training? Uh, okay, so, so like, uh, <laughs> I mean, so for this part, I think, uh, I actually does not quite understand uh, what, 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 what this uh, forward, backward algorithm actually works. But but the essential idea is that uh, is uh, actually similar uh, to the to the typical uh, with the typical machine learning right you you have a, a, a optimization objective shown here and then uh, you choose the uh, Z uh, the network parameters L and the uh, transition network T uh, you choose this uh, you choose these three uh, to maximize uh, this training objective. Uh, yeah, and then you optimize it while the uh, maybe gradient descent. Yeah, yeah, I I think it's like a specific version of the expectation maximization algorithm. So what happens is you have two things, which is calculating the marginal likelihood, which is the probability of the x, and yeah. you, in order to do this, you have to marginalize over z's. It becomes really complicated or it becomes intractable because Z's are something that you don't observe. You assume that there are like thousand Z's or something. Yeah, yeah. And then you have to calculate, marginalize over all the Z's. It becomes really complicated. So you use dynamic programming and that is the forward algorithm. Uh, not going into much details, the forward algorithm kind of like, uh, is like beam search. If you have done beam search in machine translation, it's the same thing as the, that's the forward algorithm. And um, during inference, inference means you have already calculated the transition probabilities, which are the transition between the states, which are Z1, Z2, 
and you also have calculated the emission probabilities, which is the probabilities of X given Z. So that those are the emission probabilities that you see in the annotation there. So those are the emission probabilities. So during inference, you have everything. Now during inference, you will get X. You will have to get the best possible sequence of Z's. In this yeah, yeah. paper, I think the sequence of Z's is the template. So what they do is they take the training data and then they have the X and the Y's. Uh, they will try to learn the transition probabilities, the emission probabilities, and all the other things. And during inference, what they do is during training, they pass every X and they try to get the best Z for every X. And they choose all the Z's as the common templates or the top hundred things as the common templates. And they use this for generation, I think, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's worth everyone to go back um, if you haven't learned uh, Baumwelch uh, forward, backward, and and general EM to to go um, look at those. Those are classic, I guess, machine learning and and uh, NLP problems uh, that happened before deep learning. So people are, I think, in deep learning have started sort of discovered the legacy <laughs> uh, machine learning uh, methods for doing that. So I drew a diagram on uh, on the screen that illustrates the HMM, right? The HMM is like a CRF or a MEMM, um, which basically has a sequence. This is the sequence to sequence model before sequence to sequence models were popular, right? The sequential labeling algorithm, which basically says you have a number of observations X, right? All these uh, words. And then uh, for each of these uh, words or, or things, they're tied to a specific state Z. Right in this paper, the Z can actually emit, uh, as you saw on the Yangming slides, multiple words. But in, in this, you know, your standard part of speech tagger or your standard name that it be recognized, you would only have uh, um, one one state per word, right? And what what the algorithms are always trying to do is to figure out what's the most plausible sequence of latent variables that leads to the output X, right? So um, it has to posit what are the likely parts of speech or what are the likely uh, NER candidates or here, what are the likely neural states uh, that are responsible for the words that are admitted under it. Yeah. But I think we're running a, a little short on time because we have another four papers to go and we've um, had a lot of discussion for this paper. So that's really great. I, I appreciate all the questions and I think they help everyone understand the paper a little better. But um, let's go ahead and thank uh, Liang Ming and all of our questioners um, for doing that. So we'll go on to our next thank presenter. So our next presenter is presenting text generation from knowledge graphs with graph transformers. So I um, just want to ch check who is responsible for that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm gonna... Okay. So that's Xinyan. Okay, yeah. Xinyan, you can go ahead. Um, okay. Hi, everyone. Um, today, uh, Shiris and I are going to present a paper called uh, Text Generation from Knowledge Graphs uh, with Graph Transformers. Um, uh, it, uh, in this paper, like we, we want to give you a general idea about how the knowledge graph related to the text generation. And if you're interested, and, uh, and there's also a GitHub repo here, and you can see all the codes and data here. Okay, so let's start uh, with the problem. So how to generate a multiple coherent synthesis related to uh, one specific topic? Let's take um, scientific writing as an example. Um, here in this problem, uh, there are two difficulties. The first one is that um, in the scientific writing, um, there are lots of various topics in one specific uh, subfield. Uh, for example, uh, driving and picking up stocks are all in one, uh, one, one specific uh, scientific discipline. And the second difficulty is that there are um, strong constraints on the document structure. Uh, for example, the scientific document uh, requires uh, carefully ordered explanations of the process and the phenomena. 
So uh, solution one, um, which are many researchers have thought is that um, they work with the structured inputs, for example, uh, the, the, the table structure inputs. And these um, table structures inputs uh, provide more guidance like for producing longer text, but they are only available uh, for some limited domains. And also um, they need more expenses by the manual annotation process. So here comes the second solution that is to use the information extraction systems, like to extract the text information first and then build a graph as a guidance of the text uh, uh, generation. Here's a simple example uh, showing the annotations of the uh, IE systems and the corresponding graph. Uh, we can see uh, the abstract uh, on the left <clears throat> and it mentioned the CRF model for uh, event detection. And also uh, it compares with, uh, which, with the HMM model. And it also uh, evaluates on the task of a, a same evaluate task. Uh, here, uh, there are four um, entities, which is the, the nodes of the graph, like the CRF model, the, the event detection, and also the relations uh, between these entities, which is uh, represented as the arrows in the graph. So um, after introducing this like, uh, example of how to build a graph with the IE system, uh, we can have a general idea of this uh, knowledge graph building process. So here are two steps. Um, first, it extracts all the entities and the relations for each abstract uh, with the IE system. Second, uh, they represent the annotations as a knowledge graph, which uh, collapse all the uh, referential uh, entities. Like after getting the knowledge graph, uh, we can automatically generate the test with the attention-based encoder-decoder model, which is uh, uh, the general idea of this paper. So, the, so in this paper, they uh, propose a model called Graph Writer, which is uh, like simply speaking, it uh, combines the encoder decoder with the knowledge graph. And after having like a general concept of this paper, let's uh, specify the uh, task and the motivation of this paper again. So that is given the title. Uh, of the scientific article and the knowledge graph constructed by the uh, information extraction system. The goal is to generate an abstract which is um, appropriate uh, for the given title and it express the content of the knowledge graph. So yet, yeah, so the input is the uh, title and the knowledge graph and the output is the abstract. Um, after clarifying the task of this paper, like. Uh, we can see that we need to build a data set. Uh, so, so in this paper, they uh, for the preparation, they build a data set called Agenda. Uh, that is a data set uh, contains the knowledge graphs as well as the title and the abstract. The title and the abstract are from the top AI conferences. So yeah, we can see uh, the original data is the title and the abstract, so they need to uh, build the knowledge graph. So how they build the knowledge graph here, uh, they, are, they use uh, two steps. So first they apply a ICIE system, which is a set of the art uh, IE system to build, uh, to extract uh, all the entities and relations. Then they collapse, uh, collapse the, all the entities and the relations into labeled edge, like, uh, to build a diskinetic labeled graph. Here is the statistics tables of uh, the agenda data set. Mm, let's see like how the graph writer the model works. So generally speaking, there are two parts like the encoder and decoder uh, model. And the encoder has two parts. So the first, uh, one is the title encoder, which is uh, also you know, a, a sequence encoder as it, it is uh, similar to the, uh, to, the, to the one we talked before. And the, and the second encoder part is the knowledge graph. Um, and uh, also the decoder, it is for the test generation, which is uh, 
also uh, like similar to the uh, to the to the original to the previous uh, talk the to, to, to the previous talk. So I think the main difference for this encoder decoder model with the sequence encoder decoder model is the knowledge graph part. So how they uh, encode a knowledge graph into this model, like uh, they they have they use uh, two like steps. So the first one is the graph preparation, the second one is the graph transformer, and the I will then uh, introduce these parts in detail. Like, so the first uh, uh, graph encoder step is the graph preparation. Um, that is to uh, convert the original label disconnected graph, which is like the, the data set we already already have to uh, uh, unlabel connected graph. So here's an example from the original paper, but uh, there's a little mistake of the, the, the annotation. So the V3 need to uh, be V2 and this V2 need to be V3. And we can see in this uh, example, so the, the general idea of this graph transformation is that they transform the label of the edge, like for example, R12 into two, um, uh, two reverse vertices, so R12 and the R21, and then they connect it with the uh, original entities. So, and they also, uh, so this R12 and R21 uh, uh, vertices represent the forward direction and also the backward direction. Um, and also uh, in order to like uh, promote the information flow between this uh, graph part, they also build a, a global context node which connected to all the uh, entities in the graphs. And here uh, we uh, finally we have a connected and labeled graph and the V is the list of the entities and the relations and a global node and the E is an adjacency uh, matrix that describes the, uh, the directed edges. So after the first step of the graph preparation, uh, the second step is a graph uh, transformer. Mm, the idea of the graph transformer is uh, to use the graph attention network first and then uh, the author add to uh, uh, this graph attention network is the original like the previous uh, the previously uh, model and the author adds the uh, like the so transformation functions uh, at the end. So this is the like uh, the overall flow of the of their graph transform graph transformation. Uh, the input is all the vertices, and <clears throat> it goes through. So it first goes through the graph attention. Uh, network. This is uh, like a detailed uh, graph of the graph attention network. It is a uh, uh, n-head self-attention and ni is uh, the neighborhood of the uh, vi in the graph. And a is the attention mechanism each head. And, uh, and, and after going through this uh, graph attention network, it uh, as the transformation part that is the augments and the uh, attention layers with the uh, block network and each block applies the norm and the add uh, transformation. Here's the two, the formula two uh, functions of how they do the transformation part. This is a, a feed forward network and a nonlinear non transformation, which is uh, like a similar idea of the transformer. And finally, uh, this block uh, repeated as L times. Um, okay, finishing the graph encoder part, a, like this is a, like easier one, well, like how to embedding the vertices and how to encode the titles. Um, as we can see that the vertices, there are two parts of the vertices. One is the entities, another one is the relations. And each uh, relation is represented as a forward looking and also a back look backward looking vertex, for example, the, the R12 transfer to R12 and R21. So um, we use two uh, embeddings each relation and uh, and, and also uh, we have an initial embedding for the global node G. 
So um, to produce a single uh, dimensional embedding interface, we use the last hidden state of, the, of a bidirectional uh, RNN. And also for the uh, title encoding, so it is uh, like a similar part uh, of the sequence to so sequence I, sequence encoding. So it's uh, use another bidirectional RN for embedding the title word. And the decoder part uh, and is also uh, similar to the copy net, which is uh, mentioned in the previous talks. So uh, the decoder decides uh, whether to generate uh, from the uh, graph or uh, whether to copy the uh, vertex from the graph or to gen generate from the vocab vocabulary. And the, the final probability of the output is shown here. Um, okay, before we go through the, to the experiment results, let's see the three contributions of this paper. So first they provide like a larger data set called agenda. That is to build a knowledge graph part appear, appears with the title and the abstract. And the second contribution is that they transfer the original like uh, IE's output, for example, the labeled disconnected graph into the uh, disconnected unlabeled graph. So how they do the transformation is to transfer um, each labeled edge uh, into two word, word, word reverse vertices. And the third contribution uh, they use is that they, they propose a graph transformer, which is uh, uh, which, uh, that they add the transformation functions uh, into the original uh, graph attention network. Uh, okay, then let's welcome like Shiris to present the experiment results. Yeah, uh, thank you, Shinwan, for leading through the model and how everything works. And uh, I will just take you guys through the various evaluation metrics used and some of the interesting results and how they actually went uh, got obtained these results. So uh, here the focus is given on human evaluation. So the paper, uh, the, the contributors do a mix of both human and automatic evaluation but uh, a greater emphasis is given on human evaluation and the method used is best words, best words scaling. So basically comparisons are made between different models and by ranking the different abstracts uh, from best to worst. And then later they calculate how often something is selected as the best and how uh, often something is selected as the worst model. So this was done by 15 experts who are computer science students who are familiar with the abstract writing task and they were given a couple of these abstracts given uh, obtained from different models and asked to check the difference. So in terms of the automatic metrics, uh, Blue and Meteor have been used for this task, but uh, one, one kind of uh, point, which, one point of discussion which could be raised later on is actually how appropriate these automatic evaluation metrics are for this task. And if there are any other, uh, if there are any other metrics which can be used. Uh, so, uh, Shinwan, can you move to the next slide? Yeah, uh, the implementation details are a bit dry, so I would just kind of uh, take you guys very quickly through that. So, LSTMs are used, single layer LSTMs with dropout, STD optimizer, and an adaptive learning rate across the epochs. Uh, decoding has been done using beam search, which we came across in one of the previous sessions, and the beam size is four. Uh, the attention heads uh, in yeah for the graph attention network four attention heads are used here and these models have been trained end to end to kind of ensure that uh, the the ne the op the negative log likelihood is reduced and we get a good we get a good measure of the target text vocabulary and the copied entity indices so uh, next slide. So yeah, uh, here I will take you guys through some of the interesting results. So the first uh, result you see on the screen is basically a comparison of the graph writer model against several strong baselines and how these comparisons are made is the interesting part. So one of the first things uh, laid out by this paper is the emphasis given to title, uh, the use of title entities as well as relations. And so how these comparisons work is that they compare the model graph writer, which uses everything against different models, which either don't use one of these things or more. 
So I will just explain the comparisons and the different models used first. So draft writer is the model proposed by the collaborator, uh, by the contributor. GAT or the graph attention network, uh, the graph attention network model is basically their model with the graph encoder part replaced with the graph attention network of another paper in the same domain. Uh, NTD writer, on the other hand, is only going to use, uh, oh, it only uses entities and the title without the relations as well as the graph structure, which has been used by graph writer. And rewriter, the final and worst performing model, as you can see here, just uses uh, the title in order to produce the abstract. And so in terms of the automatic evaluation, graph writer performs better than almost all the other models, which goes to show that yeah, leveraging all uh, leveraging the title, entities, and relations uh, proves to be the best approach in this abstract generation task. And the comparison with GAT, in comparison to GAT, uh, since both of these models are pretty similar, what we kind of observe is that this goes to show that the graph writer model produces better global contextualization. So if you remember in the encoding part and the graph, there was a vertex, uh, which I, I think the word, yeah, there was a main vertex, which took information, main vertex called G, which stored the, the global node, which stored the information across all vertices. So this global contextualization produced by the graph writer model gives it a better score than the rest. Uh, in terms of entity writer, it just goes to show that, yeah, leveraging the relations and the knowledge of the system works better as well. So on the, for the results on the right, yeah, we answer the question of knowledge actually improving the generation process because we see the graph writer performs better than rewriter more often and it performs worse than rewriter less often as well. So it, it, yeah, it is not as good as human authors or the gold standard, but it still performs better than not using any knowledge as in the rewriter case. Uh, next, uh, the, the next result on, yeah, the next result on the screen is basically human judgments of just the graph writer and the entity writer model. So this is to assess to the case of the structure which the graph model produces compared to the entity writer model, which does not use a graph kind of structure. And so how this works is that this helps in, this helps in the graph writer model providing a detailed structure, which is very important for the task which we are doing, which is to produce scientific abstract. And so something, uh, uh, one of the things about scientific abstract is the importance of coherence. Uh, that is, does it should have a good flow from an introduction to stating the problem, then describing the solution. And also after that is discussing the results and so on. So this kind of coherence is uh, obtained well by the graph writer model. And as you can see, the structure is the key winner here. Uh, the informativeness part, which is basically does the, which is basically, which basically implies if the, the abstract given, it relates well to the title as well as the entities. That is pretty well as well. Uh, in that measure, the graph writer model does pretty well. And in terms of the grammar and overall fluency structure, uh, it is pretty good as well. And the final, the, the final result, uh, oh, do you know, uh, next please, yeah. The final result is basically an extra comparison done only with rewriter. So one of the things about uh, this kind of comparison is that uh, if we compare rewriter model, which only uses the title to the graph writer model, which leverages the title entities as well as relations, the authors kind of, uh, the authors didn't think it would be a very good comparison. So they created this infer entity writer model, which just uses the title. Uh, it just uses the title and the information extraction and the knowledge extracted from the system. And so we see that this clearly performs better than the rewriter model as well. And in the final slide, next please. Yeah, I have just kind of labeled out what are the key results from this paper. So one of the key kind of, one of the, one of the key results from the paper is just that the graph writer model outperforms the rest. And it's most important comparison was with the graph attention network, which goes to show that uh, just 
which goes to show that the encoding part, which has been, uh, which was explained by Shinwan, actually produces a global contextualization, which is quite important for the scientific abstract. Uh, the other results follow pretty closely as well. So it, we see that models leveraging titles, entities, and relations easily outperform, outperform those with lesser information, uh, including knowledge in the abstract generation process improve model performance, as we could see with the comparison to rewriter. And the structured knowledge is produced by using the graph, which could have been, which was seen by comparison with entity writer model. And yeah, all these models use title for the abstract generation process. And yeah, with this, we come to a conclusion of this paper. And yeah, we would like to open the floor for any questions. Thank you. So Tang Yao has a question. Maybe you can go first. Yeah, I, I just wonder how how is the uh, context the global node calculated? Is, is it like a similar similar to relation nodes, or is it treated specially the G node? So yeah, uh, I yeah if uh, Shino, could you go to? I guess it's in page number twenty two. That's slide twenty two. So there's a slide with the other nodes and relations. Yeah, so G is G is basically the G is basically obtained by creating the global node by just connecting to all of the different vertices, right? Which are the list of entities relations, yeah, which are the list of entities here. And I if I remember correctly, yeah, they have they've just added the G node while while transforming the, the disconnected graph into the bipartite graph. So it's like a global node which connects to all the which connects to all the entities in the earlier structure. I suspect I, I suspect it's the average of the embeddings of all of the uh, other nodes. But I'm not sure. We actually were discussing that with Xinyuan and Sheras yesterday. And we are not exactly sure what is uh, G representing exactly in vector space. Yeah, I also wonder if the direction matters because from this uh, diagram, the arrows are all starting from G to the nodes. Yeah. Does this mean anything? Especially? They are probably little dotted arrows just because G is uh, artificially here to make a fully connected graph. Okay. Um, uh, yeah. So I also am not clear, even after reading the paper, exactly how the G node is uh, manufactured and inferred. Um, like Alexander already said, the G node is to connect all parts of the graph so that um, when you do the smoothing represented by the GAT, that it can smooth over um, an adjacent node. So if you know GAT, basically, um, this graph attention network allows you to um, pull in other nodes nearby into the representation of a, a current node. So for example, if I wanted to represent V1 on this graph, right? Um, basically, what we're doing here is just saying that uh, when, I, when I represent this node, Right, I want to pull in other nodes nearby. So I'm going to pull in, let's say, the, the original neighborhood, which is just um, these nodes here, OK? Because V1 is directly connected to R12 and R21, as well as G, right? So we can do that. But when we go with um, these uh, other models that improve on GAT, basically, you're allowing um, the representation of V1 to incorporate further neighbors, right? So the idea is that now all the nodes in the graph could be represented inside of V1 because they're all directly connected, uh, no, indirectly connected to uh, V1, uh, either through G or, uh, you know, to V2 through the, those R nodes, right? So it's a, a smoothing process because we want to assign some information about V uh, from the other nodes. So for example, if you look on the left-hand side of this diagram, right? Um, let me clear this up, right? We have two relations 
uh, V1 and V3 that are related uh, to V2 and V4 through some relation, V uh, R12 and R34. But these might be like sequentially mentioned things um, somewhere in the document, right? So maybe we want to know that after V1 and V2, we would put V3 and V4. And so that information is being encoded somehow uh, in the in the G node. Okay, that, that's that global context that Xin Yuan was uh, talking about and that uh, uh, Shreyas and K, uh, KP basically said that the mm -hmm. system wins in the structure because it can incorporate global context, right? If you don't have that global context, you're basically uh, creating sentences, uh, but they're not somehow um, put into an abstract form, meaning it doesn't have that nice sequential property that we expect abstracts to have, right? First, you talk about the problem, then you talk about the method, then you talk about the evaluation and then the discussion, right? So this type of formulaic uh, writing style would be missed if we didn't have these um, uh, overall uh, structure, right? The global context node is basically trying to arbitrate which, which type of uh, sentence to generate next. Okay, good questions. Uh, other questions? We do have time for one or two questions. Yeah, Ming. Yeah, uh, so uh, uh, can you go back to slides 18? That is the, uh, yeah, this one. Uh, yeah, I, I only want to say a few words about this task, uh, not the model. So actually uh, this task uh, actually takes a, a graph as an input one to, uh, based on this graph to generate the abstract, right? Uh, and uh, they use the, uh, the actual human written abstract uh, for evaluation, uh, but uh, uh, I'm wondering one uh, problem is that, uh, can we really uh, write a good abstract just based on this graph? Uh, because for example, here, uh, the last sentence here says that our model outperforms HMM models by 15%, but, but this 15% uh, does not even appears in the graph. So how can we expect that uh, we can write uh, this 15% uh, information based on this graph? Um, so, uh, so like, um, I, actually I have seen some uh, similar generation problems, uh, uh, generation tasks uh, like this. For example, I, I, I remember that I, I, I have seen uh, one paper that tries to given one image of the food and then to write the uh, whole uh, recipe for, for, for that image. Uh, so, but, but I think, uh, uh, even you ask a human to, to do that, it is, it is impossible. So how can you expect that the model can do it well? Uh, so um, yeah, yeah, I understand that uh, uh, whenever you have uh, the training data, you, you can always do that because uh, uh, sequence to sequence, you, you just need to feed the, uh, feed the input and output, then the model can work. Uh, but but uh, even if the model works, uh, it may not, because of uh, uh, you really understand this graph, but but uh, some part of this may be because of the overfitting of the data set. <clears throat> uh, so do you think? Uh, it's not the goal of the exercise here. The yeah. goal of the paper is to produce coherent, a coherent set of sentences. Um, so uh, it doesn't mean that the uh, set of sentences reflect what is in the paper or what was in the original abstract, but that you just need to read like they were written by a human. So if you get the graph and then you are asked to write some abstract out of it, you will probably need to make up something like the 15% number. But then uh, if you, are some, you ask someone to judge the quality of your output, and pass, you know, check as a Turing test. If this was written by a human without looking at the paper that it's supposed to be an abstract for, then someone might say, yeah, 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 that's coherent. And that's enough for this task here. So, uh, um, yeah, yeah, I understand. I, uh, so, uh, so I, I just want to say maybe the, uh, uh, maybe the paper will introduce um, uh, another way of uh, evaluation. Uh, because if you use the human written abstract for evaluation, uh, I think it may not uh, 
that will appropriate because the uh, because the, the graph does not contain all the information uh, uh, in the in the human written abstract. Yeah, I think this is one of the struggles of NLG is, uh, as everyone here knows, especially Liang Ming, um, is evaluation. Uh, and, and we have this all the time also in other fields like computer vision, uh, and not computer vision, but um, computer graphics, right? Like in computer graphics, you can create a new um, visualization of a cloud, but how do you decide whether that cloud is better than another cloud? So. Um, it's generated by another algorithm. It's all subjective, right? So NLG is like that too. But I, I take uh, what um, Liang Ming is, is saying is that, you know, the, the accuracy of the, the generated text is, is uh, questionable because, uh, you know, you only have a graph representation of the paper. But then what Alexandra says is, is very clue, uh, true, which is that the, the purpose of this paper is to generate coherent text. And uh, all of you should be um, very clear that the quality of the output and the quality of the model is uh, inherently linked with the quality of the input, right? So if the input data set like this, uh, uh, I don't remember what it's called, um, uh, data set is not particularly good, you know, uh, let's say their uh, named entity extraction or their edge typing is not very strong then um, you know, there's garbage out. So uh, we, we need to really condition on it um, to, to think whether this uh, representation is, is actually doing a, a lot of work. Yeah. Okay, other question, Alex? I, I have some questions, but uh, it's mostly things that we discussed yesterday and we didn't really find an answer for. But I'm not sure if we have time for them because we just have half an hour and still how many papers to cover? Two more? Yeah, we have two and three more, I think. So why don't we go ahead and, um, yeah. you know, we can take them offline in the documents. Yeah. So again, if you're um, interested in helping the scribe, please do. Uh, you can get some practice. I, I know our uh, week five scribes are being quite busy on the document. So uh, let's go ahead and thank Xinyuan and uh, KP for their presentation. And we'll go on to our third presentation. It's okay if we don't finish all of the, the, the documents. It's not so important. It's more important to get a good discussion. Uh, so that, that's uh, one thing that we need to make sure that we do. Okay, so uh, let's go on to the third presenter who will be presenting, I guess, the next paper. So I think uh, uh, Abdul also mentioned this, but uh, for those teams going forward in week six, week seven, and so on, perhaps we should try to scale the papers back to about um, three, um, no more than four papers, just because it's very difficult to have a discussion if there's five papers, right? And we're going to be in lecture rather than discussion. And I think we, we do want to be in a discussion group rather than a lecturing seminar. So, um, you know, I think it's more helpful for everyone if we have questions and disperse because, you know, questions and discussion force you to pay attention. Whereas lecturing, you can then multitask, look at Facebook, play Fortnite, whatever you want on the side. That's no problem to multitask. Everyone's good at that. Okay, so um, let's go to our third presenter. Um, I think you've turned on your screen share, but I can't see anything. I, I don't know about the rest of you. Uh Hi, it's it's my screen. You can okay. no one can see anything. No, I can see a black screen. No, it's black. black screen. We see mm -hmm. your cursor moving around. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, Judith, you can try to share again. If it doesn't work, since you guys are on the same shared document, maybe somebody locally here can share. Like uh, KP is on the document, so maybe he can share, and you can just tell. Okay, now it's working. Great. You can. See okay, now? Peter, if you can go ahead, yes. Okay. Um, okay, I'm going to keep my video off because my internet is not very really great. Um, so I'm going to be presenting this paper on pre-training based natural language generation for text summarization. It was a paper presented last year in uh, CoNL. So first to give a little bit of the background, um, in terms of text summarization, there are two methods, extractive and abstractive. Uh, basically, in the extractive method, we just 
pick some sentences from the already existing text and put it in the abstract or in, in summary. But when in the abstractive generation method, we generate new words by re given the context of the document, we generate new words and put them in the summary. So in this paper, they focus on the abstractive method and um, the type of documents that are, the type of task is to have a single document multi-text summarization. That is the, with for uh, a summary, a multi-sentence summary is generated for a single document. So basically the motivation of the task. So for previous abstractive methods, there are uh, two major problems. The first one is that while generating the summary, the uh, complete context of the uh, text is missing. The second problem is that they do not use a pre-trained uh, language model like BERT on the decoder side. More language models are used on the encoder side, but none is used on the decoder side, thus the context is missing. So for that, to, to solve these two problems, this paper uses bidirectional bi context for decoding process. Um, the encoding is pretty much the same. We use the, uh, the uh, language model to encode the document. However, the decoder works in two stages, uh, which I will explain later. Uh, it uses both the left, left context only decoder as well as a decoder which uh, has the context using the uh, language model. So I'll go on to explain the model. So the, the left side is the encoder, which is pretty much the same as the um, previous method. So the document is taken into consideration and is given to the BERT language model, which generates the document embedding. It's pretty much the same. The uh, a decoder, however, works in two stages. In the first, the first stage is called the document draft summary, which means that there is a draft which is generated, a draft summary is generated at, as the output. Um, at first, the, the sequence to sequence model is used to generate a sample summary. Uh, this sample summary is then given, in, given to a multi-head attention decoder along with the input embeddings, the, the uh, document embeddings. Um, which the, the multi-head attention decoder then calculates um, conditional probability for each instance, thus generating the uh, summary draft output. Um, in, this, in this stage, also the copy mechanism from the copy net paper that was already discussed is, um, is incorporated so that uh, out of word vocabularies, if, if there are words that are generated by the summary draft decoder, which is not in the input document, there needs to be a method to enable the, these sort of out of word vocabularies. For this purpose, they uh, incorporate the copy mechanism that was already discussed in previous uh, weeks. Um, the stage two of the uh, decoder is called the summary refined process. Um, we, it basically takes the draft summary as the out, as as the input, along with the uh, input uh, document embeddings. Um, the the uh, the draft summary is taken as the input, and a and a refined summary, which is the final summary of the whole document, is produced as the output. So at each timestamp, the the one of the words of the summary draft is masked and a context uh, vector is generated using the BERT uh, language model. So at this, uh, once the uh, contextualized vectors are generated from the BERT model, there is the whole context of the summary, which was generated by the draft output, of course, but since we have the context of the summary, we could take the input as well with the uh, multi-head uh, decoder, attention decoder, to predict the final output. So in this case, we will have both the input document and the context of the summary draft to generate the output. Um, okay. So 
for both the decoders, for both stage one and stage two decoders, there is something called the mixed objectives that is incorporated. This is done because the evaluation is done using the Rouge metric, which is basically the recall metric, which calculates the uh, number of words that are overlapped between the generated summary and the ground truth summary. However, in the uh, training phase of both stage one and stage two uh, decoders, the uh, objective is to increase the maximum likelihood of the uh, uh, generated sequences. So there is a mismatch in this case. To solve this problem, they, uh, they incorporate mixed objectives. That is, the objective is now to increase the maximum log likelihood, but also to encourage the generation of uh, new words, uh, abstracter words. So as you can see here in this um, uh, formula or equation, there is a reward that is given, R stands for reward, that is given when a new word is generated or a new abstract is generated, but also at the same time maximizing the log likelihood. So this mixed objective was already um, published in another paper on 2000, in 2018 in ECL, uh, EM, EMNLP, sorry. Um, so this mixed objective is incorporated in both stage one and stage two. So it encourages the generation of new words because it will increase the reward value. So as for the results, they compare the, the results with both extractive and abstractive methods. Well, it, it obviously performs well, but however, it, one thing to note is that they do an uh, stage-wise analysis. So one stage, two stage, and two stage plus RL analysis. One stage is just a sequence to sequence uh, copy mechanism, but based on the BERT system. Two stages to use both the stages of the decoder to generate the summary. Two stage plus RL means uh, two stage, both the stages, including the mixed objective that was discussed to generate a, a summary. So um, it's you can, you can see that while using both the stages along with the mixed objectives, the results are better for both for for all uh, metrics yeah so that, that's the presentation thank you okay ask for any questions so is okay. the uh, um is the rl objective using like the, the rouge score yes the the rl objective is to you uh, is the use of the mixed objective so it's it's both the it, it the, the objective of the mixed one is to jo jointly use both the root as well as the uh, maximum log likelihood. So the objective is to optimize both of them. Oh, so so that combines to give the reward. Yes. Oh. So then the architecture is kind of like uh, basically it's like a. Encoder, decoder, transformer, but initialized with BERT, right? Is that yes, it's like a hybrid of using a, a transformer with the BERT system. Oh, okay. Then where does the copy mechanism come from? The copy mechanism is in the, in the stage one of the decoder. They just use it only when uh, there are out of word vocabularies, which are not in the input sentences. Right. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so the... Uh, hi. Uh, in the paper, the authors have said that they have masked each word of the draft simply. Uh, I don't understand. Could you please explain? That's only on in the stage two. Once, in once in the stage one, they have masked, they have said that they have masked each word of the draft simply. And then they feed it to mask, mask uh, draft. To yes, that's that's for stage two. So once you have the uh, summary draft output, so it's like the uh, draft uh, of the summary. The uh, the each word of the draft summary is masked. Well, and how does that work? Then? The the masked masked tokens are fed to the bird. So like whole whole draft simply will be masked. 
No, not the whole. Whole draft is not masked. At 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 time t, the teeth word is masked, and the word can gener generate the context vector based on the other other words. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So just to make sure everyone is clear on this, can anyone try to rephrase what Judith said about the paper? What's the key, the key points that are, you know, novel or different from, from what we've already discussed over the last couple of weeks? Anyone want to have a go? Do give it a try. Uh, I think that the uh, objective part of that uh, you have mixed objective. Um, uh, Rabio, can you speak a little closer to your microphone? It's hard to hear you. Yeah. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, it was quick, but uh, I think uh, the part of mixed objective seems quite interesting. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. So uh, uh, first, there is a maximum uh, log likelihood scenario where you maximize that. And then also the uh, uh, other part of the maximization. I think both of this consideration made the uh, somewhat improvement. But uh, overall, uh, yeah. And then that's it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so Romain and uh, uh, Laiva also mentioned something in the chat, right? So Romain, do you want to unmute and, and say? Oh, you're, you're answering Laiva's question, right? Okay, so there was a question if you cannot see it on the chat, right? Can um, the refining stage, the second stage of the summarization process further change the length of the summary draft or is it better? Is it just trying to fix the wording um, by using BERT to uh, mask out the target word and then regenerate the word that's uh, masked at that time step, right? So, uh, Romain, do you want to unmute and, and say what your answer is to that? Yes, uh, can you can you hear me? Mm -hmm. So, um, as far as I understand, the, uh, the, the BERT decoder in stage two is used to uh, replace uh, on a word by word basis. Um, so the, the structure of the summary is, uh, is probably not modified. It's only a refinement for each word, uh, which are passed by uh, masking one by one. That's right. So uh, it doesn't seem to be able to change anything, right? The, the draft is basically dictating the length of the the summary and then putting in uh, words there for consideration. And then the refinement process is choosing uh, the refining based on the BERT uh, work, right? So um, here it's also not clear to me whether the copy mechanism that's used in the uh, previous process is going to be preserved um, on the outside, right, on the second stage. So I don't know whether there is any specific parameter or marker that tells us whether a word is generated by copy directly from the source or whether it's um, pulled pulled from the other process. Uh, other questions that you guys have? So one thing about this paper that I encourage you to think about for all text generation papers is you want to actually see model output. So unfortunately, uh, they don't actually show uh, much, well, any, any of the summaries that are created. Um, and it would be good to actually see these to see what type of uh, problems that are coming out. So uh, this paper has a model, it has some interesting ideas. Um, uh, but it doesn't give too much analysis on the actual output, um, you know. Uh, so that that's uh, a concern, I, I would say, for for many people in generation is you you do want to have some good idea of what what's actually being output. Um, 
so that you can verify it with your own eyes and, and then do a fair apples to apples comparison so that you leave um, one, one part of your model out using ablation and then you can study the effects of how, how that uh, particular variable uh, missing out uh, would, would influence the result. Okay, so any of you doing generation uh, for summarization may, may think about this work as a, a baseline for your projects if you're, you're face, thinking in this direction. Okay, so let's thank Judith uh, for her presentation. Okay, uh, and let's go to our last paper uh, of the day. So um, let's see who is going to give that paper. Okay, so I think Shulin, uh, you're giving the paper, is that right? Yeah. So when you're ready, you, you can me? unmute. Yeah, we can hear you and see you. Thank you for turning on your camera. Since you're local okay. to Singapore, I guess you have better bandwidth. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. I'm the last one to present, so it's almost there. Um, um, since we have learned several text generation uh, methods, like uh, a learning template, uh, generating using the knowledge graph, or using the uh, pre-trained model BERT for generation, um, here, I, I want to prepare, present this paper. It also used the BERT for text generation. The name is Distilling Knowledge Learned in BERT for Text Generation. This, this is a paper from ACL 2020. Uh, sorry for me to forget to put the information here. Um, okay, let's just start. Um, as we know, BERT is a BERT or some other pre-trained uh, language models are very powerful encoders uh, in some in many NLP tasks like text uh, classification or natural language inference or some other uh, understanding tasks. So, um, but uh, the the ability of BERT applied uh, in text generation is less investigated. Uh, maybe some the last paper is one of the methods. Um, here, um, how can we apply the pre-trained language model into language generation? Um, maybe the most uh, popularly uh, popular or commonly used method is try is that we uh, initialize our designed neural network by the parameters from the pre-trained lang uh, language models. But uh, this kind of method could uh, brings uh, could bring two kind of problems. One is that uh, we can only design our neural network with the identical structure with the uh, language models. Uh, that means we cannot use smaller uh, neural networks uh, because almost all the language models are large. Um, as for the second problem. Um, um, uh, basically, uh, almost all the, all the current methods use BERT as encoders, but uh, the, 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 they are, uh, the decoders are less investigated. Uh, the reason is that um, the, 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 the BERT, the pre-trained language model BERT is a masked language model. It, it is not autoregressive, which means uh, we will randomly mask several words from the input and try to predict the, those words from the output. Uh, this is different from the sequence to sequence generation, which generate word, uh, word by word uh, with the input and the several previous, previously generated words. So it's not, it's not a similar mechanism between these two uh, two motors. So, but BERT uh, actually contains many uh, powerful informations, like uh, the bidirectional information and some pri some prior knowledge of specific domain. So, if we can use BERT for text generation, it would be a great planning ahead for the later text generation. Yeah. So. 
uh, let's just get into the main topic of the paper. Uh, there is a concept, knowledge distillation used in this paper. Uh, it's actually a process that we train a student model P uh, under the soft, uh, with the soft labors produced by a larger teacher model Q. Uh, that means we want to learn the knowledge uh, learned by the larger model. Uh, we want to learn the, the knowledge from the larger model into the smaller student model and also want to keep the similar performance. Um, so uh, the, the objectives of this uh, technique is uh, like the formula on the right. Uh, it has two, uh, two, two targets to optimize. One is the, uh, the loss between the soft labors produced by the pre-trained the large model with the students, uh, student model's prediction. And the other is the, uh, the loss between the prediction and the true hard labors. We will not cover too much about this here. This is just a, a initial uh, intro introduction. And so let's turn to the, the uh, framework for, this, uh, for the method in this paper. Um, different from the previously um, uh, proposed knowledge distillation method, uh, in which the teacher and the student neural, neural networks are trained under the same task. Um, but here uh, we want to use the pre-trained language model as the teacher and the sequence to sequence text generation method as the student. Um, this, this, this tool is, uh, is not the same task because uh, this is for, um, uh, this is use mask uh, t uh, language, uh, mask the language, language model. So uh, in this paper, the author proposed a conditional mask language model to make the, to fine tune the BERT uh, as a model that is compatible with the sequence to sequence language uh, generation model. Uh, so let's talk about the details. Um, basically, uh, uh, in a sequence to sequence generation model, uh, here I didn't get, get, uh, uh, present a formula here. We just see the, see the formula here in the next page. Um, given the, uh, for a sequence to sequence generation model, given the input and the previously produced words, we want to predict ne the next word yt. And uh, the, the whole target for this task is uh, uh, minimize the whole less for uh, the less for the whole sentence. So, but for the uh, mask language model, the here we just put the um, uh, the input and the output together to uh, uh, for the mask language model pre-training. Um, for this for this kind of model, we will randomly mask several words from x or y. And try to produce, uh, try to predict the the mask words. Um, actually, is this is different from the sequence to sequence because we for sequence to sequence they need to produce the uh, the sentence based on or conditioned on the input x. So in this paper, the author uh, produce a conditional mask language model in which. Um, they keep all the input words and uh, try to predict some words from the output with this mask the uh, mechanism. So this um, this process will make the this uh, language model more compatible with the sequence to sequence uh, generation model. So then, how can we uh, distilling knowledge from the uh, previously uh, fine-tuned mask language model. Um, here we use a uh, technique to distilling knowledge. Um, this is the loss for, uh, for the task. Um, actually, uh, the, the loss by directional is uh, a cross entropy loss between, um, uh, is a cross entropy loss except that the um, 
the ground truth labor is not the uh, the hard labor, but the continuous logic produced by the uh, biting the bird. So here is here p phi phi is the per parameters for the bird, and this this one means the uh, uh, the logic generated uh, or produced by the bird uh, bird model for 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 the current uh, words is a diff distribution produced by bird. So we can uh, that that means we can use the the soft labor from the bird to to guide the training of our uh, sequence to sequence model. And uh, finally, we will combine the ordinary sequence to sequence loss with the uh, loss by direction together with the weighted sum and got the final uh, loss, uh, final objective. So the whole model is trained under this mechanism. Um, let's see some exper experimental result. Uh, the paper uh, applied the, this proposed method on two uh, generation tasks. One is the translation and the other is the, the abstractive summarization. And let's see the first three table uh, on three uh, different uh, language translation. Uh, as we can see, uh, all the model with the bird teacher got a better result than the, than the baselines, both, uh, both the transformer base or the uh, RM base. Uh, here, here is a di here is a method that performed better than the proposed method. Uh, this is because the dynamic uh, convolution method used a larger transformer as their backbone. So this is a, maybe not a, a fair comparison here. Um, so uh, as for the summarization, um, the proposed method also get similar result in their internal split the uh, validation and testing data set. Um, they do this because they found a disparate uh, distribution between the original uh, uh, validation and testing data set. So they just uh, split the original validation data set into two half. One is for the validation and the other for the testing. Uh, th this table is uh, is uh, is a result for the original split splitting. Um, as we can see, we can also uh, this method can also get a comparable result, but um, uh, it seems uh, okay. Okay, so um, this uh, in this paper they also do some ablation study on their uh, on their proposed method. Here, the transformer plus bird L to R means uh, they fine tune the bird with the left left to right generation uh, pattern. Uh, uh, as we can see, the result is even plural, plural than the transformer base because uh, the reason may be that the left to right generation could uh, could perform an opposite effect on this generation um, task. Uh, and also there is the transformer plus bird small. This means uh, they use a smaller bird version, uh, which only use, only have has uh, six layers of uh, multi-head attention, that kind of uh, operations. Um, as we can see, the, this this method also this uh, method also got a got a better result than the transformer base. That means even uh, we use uh, the smaller bird uh, version to guide to uh, uh, the knowledge from the smaller version of bird. We can also get some perform uh, promotion. So also there is some uh, analysis on this method. Um, this paper tried to uh, investigate the, uh, the bird teacher performance with the generation lens. Uh, from these diagrams, we can found that um, 
bird teacher could generate better results when the uh, when the length is longer. As we can see, the the the, the yellow ones are better than these blue ones. But uh, this method lose their uh, advantage when the length is too small. And um, I think this result may be because that uh, the bird can have some prior information. So even when the when the generation length is long, uh, the bird can also can still have some information for for generation, and the uh, this, the bird can resist the loss of memory or loss of uh, information from the previous words. Um, so they can uh, so this this bird teacher can produce more meaningful wor words uh, when when the length is long. But for the uh, for the shorter shorter generations, uh, since uh, we we all we 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 all know that sequence to sequence actually uh, performs well on some short and uh, maybe blend miss uh, uh, word uh, uh, sentences. It, the sequence to sequence are good at the good at these generations, and the. The bottom is the uh, produced qualitative result from this uh, method. One is the one is from the transformer base, and the other is this proposed uh, is a result from the proposed method. Um, as we can see, um, the proposed method can generate more coherent um, words with the context, like I. When uh, I start reading at the age of two, but not uh, start reading with two years, this is not this rarely happen in language. Yeah, so it seems that the bird teacher can do some contribution to the more natural generation. So um, here is some summaries. Uh, in this paper, uh, it proposed a. Uh, uh, a method to distilling knowledge from the pre-trained the bird model. This actually give us some um, some inspiration because we can use this distilling knowledge uh, technique to transfer the knowledge from the uh, like well pre-trained or some uh, large model to the uh, smaller ones. Then. That means we maybe can transfer the uh, pre-trained uh, knowledge to some low resource task or some other transfer learning task. So um, this is uh, this this is all the content I want to present today. Um, thank you for your listening. If you have some if you have some questions, please uh, feel free to ask. Okay, thanks, Shilin, for the presentation. So uh, let's go to questions. I know it's three o'clock already, so if you have to leave, you, you're welcome to go. Um, but if you have questions, let's let's have a couple. So uh, maybe we can start by trying to summarize the paper in in lay terms. If we were to to apply our own summarization procedure as a human. How would we say, uh, you know, re rephrase the paper's um, contributions here? You know, it really does build on the last paper, so I'm glad that the, the, the two of you um, in, in the team conferred to present these two papers in a sequence. All right, so this paper is um, building off of the, the intuitions of the first paper. Anyone want to give it a go? Yes, I think this is, uh, it looks like a simple um, uh, per, uh, uh, method. But I think the, uh, the, uh, the intuition behind this method is also, is also meaningful. If we want to do some transfer learning or something uh, like this. So Zitang, uh, did you want to say, uh, give a, a summary? Yeah, go ahead. Or a question. Yeah, yeah, I, I... Yeah, I can have a try. Yeah, I, I okay. think this paper's uh, goal is to try to um, make use of the future generation results to improve the generation of um, auto regressive model. So, yeah. 
uh, in, in order to do this, the, the paper designed a new language model, new language model called the conditional mask language model. So, so that by using this um, conditional mask language model, we can get the um, soft label from this um, special language model. And, and later by making use of this soft label and the knowledge destination techniques, we, we can inject this uh, future planning generation knowledge in, in, into the autoregressive generation. So I think that's, that's, that's the whole story. Yeah, that's what. Great, I think that's very accurate. So Eugene asks, is the bird teacher model also being fine-tuned when the train training sequence to sequence model. Do you want to unmute and, and say what you mean by that? Hello, yeah, can you yeah. hear me? Yeah, mm -hmm. so I'm just curious, is the bird teacher model also being trained when you are training the sequence to sequence model? What? Is the bird model being trained? Or are yeah. we just using it directly? Um, the bird model is fine tuned uh, with the conditional mask uh, mask uh, mask language model uh, because uh, for the sequence to sequence we have an input and the output uh, for for the uh, uh, for the general ma uh, bird language uh, bird language model they just mask uh, randomly mask several words from the input and try to predict. But for the conditional master language model, the input is all uh, is all kept kept, and uh, we want we try to produce uh, predict words from the output. So it kind it kind of simulates the, the the process of sequence to sequence. So the bird model being used is actually a fine tuned bird. Am I right? What? It's a fine tuned bird that is being used. Yeah, it's, not... it's fine tuned, and oh. the, the fine tuned bird model was used in in this distilling process. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Uh, yeah, I had a question. Go uh, for it. Yeah, so uh, they said that while uh, in board, uh, when board does masked language modeling, uh, in this are both X and Y tokens were masked, right? But while they were noise distillating from the board, they only masked the Y part of it. They only masked the Y tokens. So why is it so much? And why didn't they try it with the X part also? Uh, you mean why we mask the right part of yeah. Uh, th yeah. this, oh, this okay. Y? Yeah. yeah. Because we want to predict words uh, in the output. So uh, we try to uh, 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 fine tune the bird on such a mechanism. We can we can uh, produce word uh, from y, uh, we conditioned on x and some other part from y. This I think um, is an intuitive yeah. process. Did that answer your question, uh, yeah. about Fidia? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, we, we are trying to use it. Uh, I mean, BERT was not originally conceived for natural language generation, right? It's just a pre-trained language model. So uh, the idea is uh, basically, you know, can we use these huge pre-trained models um, that we get from other sources and then find a way to use them in natural language generation, right? So the whole problem here is that when we are using uh, them for natural language generation, we're generating the input uh, in the current state of the art, uh, probably not something that we really want to do is generate from uh, right, uh, left to right, right? I mean, you can see, like we talked about this last lecture too, like when you generate natural language, you are not actually doing it from left to right. There's some mental model going on and you have a hierarchical structure, most likely going on in your thought process. And then you have to linearize it out as the sequence of words, right? But the current state of the art is basically just left to right. So um, what, what they're trying to get around here is the fact that Burke gets to look at the entire uh, sequence, right? Uh, feature tokens as well, and to add that in. Um, so I'd like you to also think about this model. If you look at the analysis that Shilin presented at the last couple of slides in the, the studies on this slide, yeah. 
you can see that the places where it tends to get better are longer sentences, but that the, 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 the help from BERT is fairly limited. I mean, if you look at the phrases that are underlined that have been corrected, they're not very long. They're only about um, four to five words long. So the type of forward, infor, um, you know, the, the future information that's being helped in the language generation process here in BERT is still very, very local. It's just within a phrase, you know. And I, I think the, the curious thing to say is like, if I were to generalize this idea of looking future in the future context, how could I structure natural language better? And you see that in some of the papers that we previously looked at, like in the, the graph generation paper, right? It's the idea of using information about how the entire sentences or entire claims are structured within an abstract that help you produce global coherence. So that one is the more global nature paper. And this is a much more local uh, uh, paper because you know BERT is somewhat local. It's only looking at the context within a single sentence. Right, so um, you can think about what natural language is heading towards. You know, we we have all of these very simple left to right models, but they don't. We we I don't think anyone believes that that's the way that people or that we want processes to actually generate natural language. Right, if you look at traditional natural language work, it's always that you have um, uh, what they call a, a, a strategic planner as well as a tactical planner. The strategic planner is basically you know, strategizing the text, like the argumentative, what you're trying to accomplish, like say that the uh, um, pragmatic uh, idea, why, why are you talking in the first place, right? And then the uh, tactical generation is what we're doing in all these pre-trained language models and things like that, right? It's just concerning which words go together to convey a sentence. And right now we're still at the part where we're just saying, okay, well, if I already said this, what's the next thing that I should be saying? that type of thing, right? So it's very, very limited. So I, I think you'll see within the next uh, three to four years, a lot more work on these types of ideas, but taken up a notch. And when I mean up, I mean hierarchically up to the uh, um, constituent level when you're trying to plan out a whole sentence, what's the sentence structure? Rather than left to right engrams, right? Which is what we're doing right now. And then from the constituent level to the, the clause level and from the clause level to the sentence and the sentence to, some argumentative structure. So if you know rhetorical argument structure or, or discourse, right? When you're, when you're uh, giving an utterance or uh, uh, a paper, there must be some persuasive form why you're saying all those sentences in the first place. So those types of things are completely, completely missing from BERT, completely missing from all of the natural language models that we have. Because remember, we are talking about language models. Those are n-gram models. I mean, how limiting is that? You're just talking about you know, what's the words to left and what's the words to right, okay? Who cares what the whole sentence or, 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 or the essay is about, right? So um, I, I think we are at some type of um, nice locus point where you can sort of predict, you know, you can use your own mental BERT model about research and predict what's in the future, right? And then try to draw out what's going to happen in, uh, in the local context, okay? So um, with that, I think we should come to an end because it's already 3.13. But uh, if you guys have any questions, um, please uh, let us know now. Okay, so uh, once again, uh, we are at week five. That means everyone needs to put in a, a project proposal. By week seven and eight, uh, we need to flesh them out into abstracts. So um, hopefully you won't run any of these NLG processes to take your project title and create an abstract from them. But even if you do, maybe that'll be very fun anyways. Um, Okay, so uh, we will see you next week, same time, uh, starting at one. And our week six crew, uh, which is going to be looking at domain adaptation, uh, will be uh, starting from there. Let's thank uh, Kathy, uh, Shilin, uh, and all of the other presenters uh, today for their hard work. So uh, unmute your mic, uh, turn on your camera, and let's clap for all of them. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. We'll see you next week.